Can you hear me all right? Especially in the back? Yeah. Excellent. Great. If the voice fades or something, let me know and I'll, I'll kick up the volume a little bit. Uh, you know, we have a, a lot of ground to cover, and so we're just going to get uh, straight to it right away. And first, to just get kind of geographically oriented, we'll be talking about Isle Royal National Park. It's the largest island in Lake Superior, which is the largest freshwater lake in the world. And on this island is a population of wolves and a population of moose. The diet for the wolves are moose. And for moose, there are essentially two causes of death. One is to starve to death, and the other is to be killed by wolves. And that circumstance is referred to as a single predator, single prey system. And that circumstance is uh, relatively rare in the environment. And so when ecologists can find that, they have some special attraction for it uh, because it's a, a toehold to understanding other systems that might be more complicated. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the research that we do on Isle Royale, some of the findings. Uh, but before I do that, what I want to do is I want to share with you a, a little bit of insight about the creatures themselves, the wolves and the moose, the main characters. And, um, and I want to do it with a certain perspective. And the perspective that I want to approach this from requires your participation. What I want to do is I want to ask ourselves, what might it be like to be a wolf? <coughs> and we'll start with uh, thinking about moose. In the summertime, uh, moose are a creature with a purpose, if there ever was a creature with a purpose. The purpose of a moose in the summertime is to gain as much weight as it possibly can, mostly through fat so that it can be well prepared to survive the winter. Now the amount of weight that they have to gain is about 25% of their body weight. If you weigh 150 pounds, that means you'd be gaining something like 37 pounds over the course of about four months. The really nearly miraculous part about it is that moose are herbivores. They're vegetarian. They eat salad. Not the kind of salad that you get at the restaurant with croutons and bacon bits and thousand island dressing just the lettuce, right? And how is it that you could gain all of that weight in four months eating only salad? Well, the way that they do it is by eating a great deal of food. Moose in the summertime eat about 40 pounds of food a day. They take thousands of bites. They spend about eight hours of every day chewing leaves off of trees, chewing it, and then swallowing it. Now, to make sure that they get the most nutrition they possibly can out of, out of these leaves, it goes into their rumen, which is something that happens before it gets to their stomach. In the rumen, microbes work on it, then they regurgitate that, and then they, they chew their cud, just like deer do and just like cows do. This chewing of the cud is important, though, because they also spend about eight hours of every day chewing their cud. And so if you want to know what it's like to be a moose in the summertime, it is all about chewing your food, really. 16 hours fully of every day is about chewing food. It's, for many of us, it's all of our waking hours. This is how moose spend uh, their time. Now, winter is a different story. And, you know, when you think about animals in the wintertime, the thought that might come to your mind, and certainly the thought that comes to my mind very quickly, is, oh my goodness, it's so cold, and, and, and the cold is relenting hour after hour, day after day, for weeks on end. It's just cold, cold, cold. And for some creatures, this is an important concern, but not so much for moose. And to help understand this, I think a thought experiment will uh, guide us nicely. So imagine, this is kind of apropos for how warm it is here in the, in the room here, but imagine what is the temperature at which it is that you start to feel cold? You know, if you're just lightly dressed, you're not very active, when, when do you feel cold? For most people, it would be about the temperature that we set our thermostat, maybe 67 degrees, or something like that. And um, I think we're getting some flipping here, but hopefully that's not too distracting. Um, and, and, so, and so anyways, this is what happens, or this is about the temperature at which it is that we get too cold. Now what happens when you get cold? The first thing that happens, and this happens to us as well as it does to virtually all mammals, including moose, the first thing that happens, you don't even notice, your metabolism starts to increase. You start to burn a little internal energy to help keep you warm. The next thing that happens is that you get goosebumps. And if you remain cold and get a bit colder, you'll start to shiver. Again, all mammals, including moose, do these things when they get cold. But here's the thing about moose. Moose don't even do that first bit raising of the metabolism, they don't even do that until it's colder than about 20 degrees below zero. And so that means as cold it is, as it is on Isle Royal in the wintertime, moose don't necessarily experience cold, not in the way that you and I would think of it. Because on Isle Royal, in a typical winter, 20 degrees below zero, that might happen for just a few nights of the winter, and maybe for just a few hours of those nights. Now that does not mean that winter is an easy time for moose. 
Winter is a very difficult time for moose, and it has not to do with the cold, but it has to do with their food. And so we're talking about a 900 or a 1,000 pound animal, and their food has been reduced to twigs, because all the leaves are gone. Not only twigs, but also needles from a certain uh, tree, also fir trees and also cedar trees. One bite of food in the wintertime for a moose is equal to about a gram. It takes 27 bites to make an ounce of food if you're a moose in the wintertime. And of course, you've got to you know, trudge through three feet of snow in order to do all that. It turns out there's, it takes more energy to go and get the food than there is energy in the food. And so moose spend considerably less time in the wintertime feeding, less time ruminating, less time chewing their cud. They mostly are just waiting. Uh, moose, I don't really know what happens between their ears, but I do wonder, and it's a fine question to wonder, are they patient? Are they bored? I know they're alert. They have those ears up there, and those ears can rotate like periscopes, and they're, they're completely alert for the presence of predators at, at any moment. But, uh, but they pass time in a way that would be a little hard for us to imagine, and their relationship with food is so very different from ours. Now I want to think and spend just a few moments thinking about wolves. And wolves are... Um, really a remarkable creature. So much of what it is that we know about wolves comes to us uh, through our mythologies, our fairy tales, the symbols that we turn wolves into, symbols of hatred, symbols of love for nature, sometimes at the very same time. On the whole, this has been unfortunate for wolves. They've suffered from our symbolization of them. And it's, it's doubly tragic because if there was a creature anywhere on the planet that would be relatively easy for humans to kind of connect with and understand, it would be wolves. Because basically wolves are a kind of dog, or it's probably better to say our dogs, our best friends, are actually a type of wolf. One of the things that we have most in common with wolves is that we live in families. Wolf packs are families, and that's why dogs are, are so uh, comfortable living us, with us and us with them. We know how to get along in that situation. Wolves are also really notable for their capacity to walk. They're really these remarkable walkers. They can cover about six miles in one hour, they can walk for about eight hours of every day, easily covering, without any effort at all, 25 miles in a day. And they can do this day after day. They're really just expert walkers. They walk for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons they walk is, is, is for hunting. On Isle Royale, wolves eat moose, and moose are thinly distributed throughout the forest, so you have to walk to find one. But finding one is not the only challenge. And I should point out in this next doesn't look like it. Up at the top of the screen towards the left is a moose being chased by about half a dozen wolves there. Finding a moose is only uh, part of the task for wolves because it turns out that a healthy middle-aged moose, she is the queen of the forest, not wolves. A healthy middle-aged moose, he is the king of the forest. These middle-aged healthy moose have really very, very little to fear from wolves. And so what wolves have to do is they have to find a moose that's got something wrong with it, one that is maybe malnourished, Maybe one that's arthritic, suffering from various forms of senescence. Maybe one that's uh, starving. And uh, this is the kind of moose that they're looking for. And this finding of such a moose involves a test. And the test gets uh, manifest in various ways. But, but one, one way it's representative is that the wolves will find a moose. They will charge it. And it, within just a meter or two of arriving to the moose, they'll put the brakes on and stop. And then they look to see what the reaction of the moose is. Oftentimes, the moose just stands there. It doesn't do a thing. Not casually, I would say. Very tense situation all around on both sides. But nevertheless, the moose just stands there. The wolves retreat, maybe just a few meters. They might regroup a little bit, consult with one another, and form in a manner that we wouldn't necessarily appreciate. And they'll charge again. And again, within just a meter or two of reaching the moose, they'll put the brakes on once more. And the moose often will again just stand there. By about that time, and it takes about as much time for all that to play out as it did for me to describe it to you, and about that time the wolves will often just walk away. 19 out of 20 times that wolves encounter a moose, that's what happens. It's really not so different than every time you went to the refrigerator, only 19 out of 20 times would it open. And so, what happens on that once out of 20 occasions though, is that wolves will find a moose for which something was wrong with it. And uh, I presume, I think it's a reasonable presumption, out of fear, the moose turns around and starts running. And at this point, we can kind of pick up what happens with an image like this. Even though that moose has something wrong with it, we have to understand and appreciate that moose 
weighs 900 or 1,000 pounds. It's 10 times the size of any one of those wolves. Wolves don't weigh as much as we do. Not a royal wolf might be something like 80 pounds. And they're going to kill it with their teeth. Really, reflect on that just for a moment. Yeah, sure, they've got different teeth than we do, and yeah, they've got some extra muscles in their head for their jaws, but nevertheless, imagine yourself in the position where you're going to kill something ten times your size, and you're going to do it with your teeth. It really is, is quite a feat. You say, oh, yes, but there's, there might be eight or ten wolves, and yes, sometimes packs are that big, but most uh, the killing of moose is primarily focused with just two or three wolves, usually the adults, the, the alpha pair, and perhaps one other wolf. They're doing most of the work. And the strategy basically is this, is for one of these wolves to catch up to the moose and to uh, just latch on with their teeth. And at this point, the moose doesn't stop. The moose keeps going, right? And with each bound of the moose, you know, that wolf gets you know, kicked in the belly. The wolf is being dragged through, you know, the forest, logs and stumps and all. And just hanging on, just hanging on. The moose slows down necessarily. And upon slowing down, it gives a chance for another wolf to catch up and do the same thing, to also latch on to the moose. And now the moose will slow down even more. And the objective of the wolves at this point is to get the moose to stand still. And, and I should say, even by this time, by the time that wolves make first contact with, uh, with the moose, for the most part, the fate of that moose has been sealed. How it plays out exactly is quite varied, but, but the end doesn't look very good by the moment that wolves even get their first, their first uh, mouthful. Even in a situation like this, and we can see a couple of things on the right hand side, this wolf right here, this is one of the alpha wolves, that wolf is trying to grab the nose of that moose. And it's not unlike a bull ring on a large bull. Um, if you can control an animal this big from the nose, you have quite a bit of leverage. And then of course there's a moose on the back end of the, I'm sorry, a wolf on the back end of the moose, and that moose is not going to let go. That moose is still plenty strong enough. That moose only needs to swing its hind end around. The wolf will not let go, but the wolf's body will become airborne and smack into the side of that tree. There's hardly a wolf that's lived for more than a few years that hasn't had several of its ribs broken and then rehealed. It's an extremely common uh, kind of injury. Wolves occasionally get killed uh, trying to capture the food uh, that otherwise will sustain them. Wolves have these powerful hooks that they can kick with, both forward, uh, front hooks and, and hind hooks. Here's an image of a wolf being sent into the air after getting a little too close and not doing it uh, kind of stealthily enough. And then what happens, and it's really a combination of uh, just uh, heroic bravery and strength and athleticism on behalf of the wolves, and at the very same time, a heroic kind of endurance on behalf of the moose that doesn't quite persist. Anyways, at some moment, the moose collapses. And really, quite before the moose is dead, the wolves start feeding. Now, there's really no way to, uh, to, to judge this. It's, it can be described. And many words can be said about it. But it, at the end, it leaves one wanting for words without a doubt. And uh, really, for just the nature of the kind of planet that we live on, where so many creatures uh, live and die by the flesh of, of, of other creatures. And of course, the moose has only one other uh, real choice for death, and that would be starvation. And um, we know from studying humans that starving to death is not a very pleasant way to die. And of course, there are probably very few people in the room to kind of judge like which is the better way to go. And it can also be said that from the moment that wolves make first contact until the moose dies, that can be as brief as 15 minutes. And the longest that I had ever seen was about nine days. And so it really is just this, um, amazing uh, phenomenon that exists on our planet all the time, all around the world, not just wolves and moose, but all kinds of predators, all kinds of creatures that take their life, uh, or that make their life in the flesh of other creatures. And so anyways, there you've done it. You've killed something that is ten times your size. Okay? Now in the forest, this is going to attract some attention. Because there are quite a few other creatures that would uh, like to benefit from that. And one of the creatures that's particularly important are ravens. There's a few ravens off to the right-hand side of this image. And off the frame of the picture, in the trees would be another uh, bunch of ravens. Maybe 20 ravens is kind of typical to be in a carcass. And uh, each raven can take up to four pounds of food a day. Now, they don't eat that much. They, they eat some of it, but then the rest they'll hide up in the trees and let it freeze and then eat it later. But do the arithmetic just a little bit. Four pounds a day, 20 ravens. Make it five or six days. You do all that arithmetic, and you realize that ravens by themselves can eat 
much of a moose carcass. And so wolves need some adaptations so that they can eat that carcass fast enough so that they don't lose so much to predator or to scavengers. One adaptation that they have is that they live in groups, they live in packs. And so by living in packs, indeed, there's some sharing that goes on with brothers and sisters and parents and offspring, but at least by Darwinian logic, that kind of sharing is preferable than to give it up to other species. The other adaptation that wolves have is that they have these really enormous stomachs. Remember that a wolf weighs about 80 pounds. And when wolves start feeding on a carcass, they'll feed for several days, and they'll eat, fill up their bellies, and then they wait for that to digest, and then maybe the next day they'll eat again in another round. But that first round, in that first round, they can eat up to 20 pounds of meat in one sitting. And so even if you like to go to the steakhouse and get the king's portion, it is nothing compared to what a wolf take in a short period of time, and what would you do after eating all the meat? <laughs> wolves do the same thing. And you know, by this time, we're, we're really starting to kind of get a sense of what the life of a wolf is all about. They spend about eight hours of every day walking. They spend about eight hours of every day resting. They spend about eight hours of every day socializing with their family. And so if you like to walk, if you like to eat meat, and if you like to hang out with your family, you would find quite a few things in common that you would enjoy with wolves. The most important difference between us and wolves is that about once a week, they have to go through this very, very difficult business of trying to find a food. And so, wolves walk for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons they walk is to capture the food. The other reason that they walk is because they're territorial. To be territorial means that there's a piece of the forest that they call theirs, and they're not willing to share it with their neighbors, other packs. And the reason being is because a, a, a pack's territory is intended to be big enough to contain in it all the food that they need to keep the family going. Typically no bigger, because it's so laborious to protect more. And uh, the behaviors involved with territoriality are illustrated a bit here. In the background of that slide are a bunch of wolf traps. And in the foreground is a snowbank that's been urinated on by one of the alpha wolves. And in this urine are chemicals. You and I can't smell them, but wolves sure can. They can smell them before they can even see that snowbank. They can smell it for perhaps up to a week after that urine has been deposited there. And a message is being delivered. The message is, you know, if you're not from the pack, you're not welcome here. It'd be better for everyone if you just turned around and went back from where you came. And if you don't, you know, there could be, there could be some consequences. And the consequences in their most grave form are, are really quite serious. They include death. And so when humans are not involved in killing wolves, when humans aren't shooting them, poisoning them, running them over with our cars, in those cases there are two really important causes of death. One is starvation, and the other is when wolves kill one another. And when wolves kill one another, it's typically in these territorial disputes, and they're, they're fighting over food. And to kind of round this out a little bit, again, I, I mentioned that dogs are a particular kind of wolf, and so you won't be surprised to know that a wolf, if it could get everything that it wanted and have a perfectly safe life, would live to be 10 or 12 years old. But most wolves are dead by age four. This is true whether humans are persecuting them or not. And they're dead by age four, ultimately because it's so challenging to get food. And so, I have the great privilege, of course, of, of, of studying these creatures, wolves and moose. I sometimes am a little dismayed when people uh, share with me uh, their excitement about wolves, and it's always uh, kind of tagged on with, they're so much more interesting than other creatures. And this really is, is not the case. And so it turns out I'm a professor, and that authorizes me to issue homework assignments, and we have one. First of all, to understand the homework assignment, think about what it is that we just did. We spent a, a bit of time really engaging our imaginations about what it might like, what it might be like to be a wolf or a moose. And then, and this is really an important part, I shared with you just a couple of things. I said that uh, moose chew their food a lot, and I said that wolves walk a lot. But what we did is we took those simple facts and we, and we spent some time kind of reflecting on them. And one of our challenges in the society that we live in is that we're awash with information and it can be distracting from our own kind of understanding of, of the world around us. If you take the robin that lives right outside of your window, if you take the chipmunk that lives right outside, your house, and if you learn one or two things about that animal, how it is that they get their food, if you want a real challenge, think about the worm that the robin is after. Think about what their lives are like, where do they spend their time most of the time, which of course is underground. If you reflect on that, you will discover it in a heartbeat that those animals are easily as fascinating as wolves and moose. It's a homework assignment. I will accept your uh, homework uh, whenever you have it ready. I'm not hard to find. And seriously, I would love to know what, to, what you came with. 
Now what I want to do is I want to shift gears and I want to think a little bit about the work we do on Isle Royal with the wolves and the moose. Um, one of the things that's been done every year for the last 56 years or more, or coming up a little bit more than 56 years, is, um, is counting how many wolves and moose there are on the island each year. In addition to that, uh, or uh, one of the ways in which we do that is, is from small aircraft from which we can make our observations. One of the other things we do is that when wolves kill a moose, we let the wolves feed, however long that may take, three or four days, whatever the case may be. When the wolves leave, then we land that plane on the nearest frozen lake, we put it on our snowshoes, we hike in, we perform a necropsy. Of course, the carcass is frozen by that point. And uh, we try to understand what it was that was the cause of death for the moose, and also not the cause of death, but the condition of the moose at the time of death. We want to know, was it a healthy moose that the wolves killed it? Maybe that a big deal to the moose population. Or was it a moose that really had something seriously wrong with it? And um, and the fact that the wolves killed it is not such a big deal to the moose population. That's the, that's the basic idea and some, some of the things that we're after. This study is also the longest study of any predator prey system in the world. And I want to illustrate some of that idea through a series of graphs. And these graphs are, uh, I'm going to show them to you just bits at a time. And this will be a little frustrating as I stare at this. You've been looking at it for the last time. Oh, of course. On the left-hand side is uh, 1959. That's when the project began. Goes all the way up to the present. On the right-hand side, I'm going to track the number of moose on the right-hand side from zero to 2,500. They are in black at the moment, just on the left. Wolves are in red, also on the left. Durwood Allen is the fellow who started this project, and they watched for five years. And I'm showing you the data there. And they concluded. Well, I'll show you what they concluded. They said uh, Durwood Allen student, uh, Dave Beach, said, our studies thus far indicate that moose and wolf populations in Iowa have struck a reasonably good balance. They're referring to this idea that is also known as the balance of nature. And balance of nature has been an important idea for ecology in the modern sense of ecology for over 100 years. Balance of nature has been an important idea for Western philosophy for more than 2,000 years in terms of just understanding our place in the universe and, and how we relate to nature and so forth. Now, Durwood Allen's real um, visionary uh, attitude was very, very simple, but no one else was really doing it at the time, and to this day not that many people do it, was that, well, this is very interesting, but if something different happens, we won't know unless we keep watching. So we should keep watching. It was a very simple idea, and, but most importantly, he implemented it. And he kept watching, and after about 10 years, the moose population about doubled. And so if you thought there had been a balance of nature before, you'd have to at least concede, well, there's been a pretty big shift in that balance because there's not twice as many moose. The wolves are kind of bouncing up and down, a little hard to interpret exactly what they're doing. And anyways, uh, Durwood kept watching, and, and Rolf Peterson is on scene by now, and, and uh, there were a series of severe winters, and that gave the upper hand to the wolves in a little bit, and there was more wolf predation, and then this started to turn the tides a bit. The moose population started to decline. They went to about half their maximum abundance. And then the wolf population really went through the ceiling. There were 50 wolves in Iowa in 1980, very, very high density. And now, boy, there's really, it's really hard to hang on to that idea of balance of nature. Or if you're going to hang on to that idea, you've got to really kind of revise what you mean by that phrase. And, uh, and again, this is kind of one of the important lessons that comes from Isle Royal is that when you keep watching, it's not so simple as just an accretion of knowledge. It's, it's not just as so we have this core of knowledge and then we add a little bits to it. It's kind of a wholesale reversal on what it is that we think is happening and how things work. Not every bit of what we discover is like that, but some of the really important things have indeed been that way, and they come only from continuing to watch. What happens next is really remarkable. There was a, a tremendous um, number of wolves that died over a two-year period. They went from their all-time high of 50 to in two years, 14. Now, we didn't know it at the time, but what ended up being the cause is a disease called canine parvovirus that humans inadvertently had brought to Iowa. Was. And then what happens next, kind of jumping in from large bounds here, the wolf population makes this short-lived and kind of partial recovery, and then bottoms out at even lower numbers, spends the better part of a decade in the low teens. And while that's happening, the moose population just goes up and up and up and up. And also what's occurring at this time is that balsam fir, this is a particular tree that the moose like to eat, we were able to document, not until the mid-1990s, but we were able to document that throughout this whole period that uh, the growth of balsam fir trees were starting to slow down. 
And you may have heard of this idea of a trophic cascade. Trophic cascades are in the news quite a lot if you pay attention to kind of environmental news. They've been a very big part of the discourse about wolves in Yellowstone National Park. And the thing to understand is that while trophic cascades have been around forever, scientists haven't always appreciated them. And the first places that scientists appreciated trophic cascades were in marine systems, especially with sea otters and kelp forests, if you know that story. And uh, it turns out that Iowa Royal National Park is the first place uh, that a trophic cascade was ever documented in a terrestrial ecosystem. And, uh, and so it's been, been a great um, uh, benefit to science to kind of have understood that for the first time. What happens next, of course the moose population has uh, been increasing, wolves are low, we're starting to wonder if maybe inbreeding depression isn't also a concern here, but we also conceded that, of course this is the mid-1990s, the technology wasn't really quite available, we didn't quite think we'd ever figure that question, those questions out about inbreeding. And um, well, what happened next was a uh, very severe winter. It was a winter of 1996, one of the most severe, well, the most severe winter on record in this region. And that winter kind of coincided with a uh, uh, shortage of food. And what happened next was, uh, was a really impressive die-off of the moose. Now that first die-off in red for the wolves, that's from 50 to 14. That's dramatic because if you go from 50 to 14, you could easily go to zero very easily. And that's what's interesting there. Now the second one, there's still you know, more than 500 moose. There's no, no risk of extinction there. It's impressive for a different reason. You know, it really was just a, a massive amount of death. A large number of, of, of beautiful sentient creatures that just died. Um, there were moose, 17 that we know of, that died from falling off of cliffs trying to reach for the last few bites that were just out of reach. There were moose that died with spruce in their mouth. Spruce is as nutritious to a moose as it is to you and I. And um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was really impressive uh, what happened there. And then what happens next, the moose population slowly starts to increase, but then it starts to bottom out to the lowest numbers we've ever seen. And then wolves are kind of on this bouncy uh, increase, generally increasing, but it's, it's still got a lot of ups and downs involved. And for a while, we really didn't understand what was going on in that uh, period of time. And then, in about 2010, we made a, a pair of discoveries that uh, were pretty important and helped us understand. One of them has to do with this photograph here. This is a photograph of some wolf bones. Uh, the bone that's kind of along the outside, really there, that's the pelvis. And then these ones that are labeled with the S's, those are sacral vertebrae, that's your lower back. Those bones are supposed to be symmetrical. What's on the left is supposed to be the same as what's on the right. And you can see by the red line that I've drawn that that's certainly not the case. This is a, a well-studied type of deformity. It's especially well nutritious enough because wolves have kind of inefficient digestive systems that ravens like to eat them. But they are also, uh, they have DNA. They have DNA that, that uh, scientists can be interested in. And from those DNA, that DNA that's in the scat, we can get with basically a DNA fingerprint from, from each wolf from whom we collect the scat. And we have been doing that for uh, more than a decade. And we were stockpiling these scats. We put them in freezers, uh, hoping that someday we would raise enough money uh, to be able to analyze them all. And after, uh, after quite a few freezers full, uh, we found the money to analyze them. We did what many uh, conservation geneticists do upon getting this data. We put together a pedigree. There's a lot of kind of complicated, interesting things going on in this pedigree. I'll use it mainly just as a foil to point out this wolf, wolf number 93. We had also done some fingerprinting of wolves that were on the Canadian mainland. And in doing so, what we were able to find out is that wolf number 93, which was a wolf that we had seen on Isle Royale and whose scat we collected from Isle Royale, turns out he wasn't born on Isle Royale. He was born in Canada. And at some point in 1997, uh, when there was an ice bridge, he walked across and became part of the Isle Royale population. We really didn't think that was going on, generally, on the island. And uh, so it was a bit of a surprise for us. The other thing that's important about this uh, wolf is that what we knew about his identity all along, it turns out he's the wolf that's in the middle there, and he's easy to kind of identify because he's bigger than the other wolves. He's a lighter color than the other wolves, and that just made it easy for us to know who he was. He acquired the nickname the Old Grey Guy eventually because you know, there aren't that many wolves in Iowa that can tell one from the other, and so when we can't tell them, we, we often they get nicknames just so we can keep track of them a little bit better as we talk about them. And um, well, anyways, he was. Uh, something. We knew his identity, but we did not know his heritage. And to give you a sense of, of kind of his prowess, in a sense, he was an alpha wolf for eight years, which is twice as long as most wolves even live. He gave birth to 34 offspring. 
And to illustrate to you more of what it is that he was able to do, I'm going to show you this map of Isle Royale, and I'm going to show you some polygons that represent where the different territories are. So in 1998, that's the first year that he's an alpha male. He's the alpha male of the pack that lives in this area that's depicted here. Middle pack is the name of the pack. Then, a couple years later, one of his sons becomes a founding member of Chippewa Harbor Pack. And then, a couple years later, the immigrant begins to mate with his own daughter, so his daughter becomes an alpha female middle back. I can explain why that is in a moment. And then what happens a year later is that another son and daughter of his become the leaders of the East Pack. And then a few years later, another pack on Isle Royale becomes founded also by offspring of the old gray guy. And so in a wolf population, generally in a pack, there are only two wolves that reproduce, the alpha pair. And so that means if there are four packs, there are eight reproducing wolves. So you can see from what I just went through there that seven of the eight reproducing wolves in this period of time were either the immigrant or his immediate offspring. And so what happened is that his genes flooded the entire population. Within about 10 years of his arrival, 60% of all the genes that were in the population traced back to him, to one wolf. And that disparity between his lineage and then the Isle Royal lineage, all the other genes that came from the Isle Royal lineage, is evidence not only of the inbreeding depression that had been taking place, but also of uh, what scientists refer to as a genetic rescue. And so what we now think to be the case is that the reason that this kind of bouncy but nevertheless uh, increasing period of time is, is because of the benefits that have been brought by the old gray guy. It's important to also note that the old gray guy showed up, uh, coincidentally, uh, right at the same time that the uh, food supply for the wolf population had crashed. So things might have looked really quite dire for wolves had he not shown up, because uh, they would have been suffering from inbreeding and they would have had that food shortage. <coughs> and now, in the interest of time, I want to just kind of say some things uh, uh, to kind of skip some of the details and the evidence for how it is that we know this sort of thing. But that old gray guy caused us to do some more genetic analyses, some more calculations, more uh, kind of looking at past field notes and such. And, um, and that is a segue to the things that I'll show you now. If a wolf comes to Isle Royale, essentially the only way to get there is by crossing an ice bridge. So here's a map of Isle Royale, and then here's a satellite image of Isle Royale. It shows this, I think this is from about four years ago. It shows that on January 2nd there was some skim ice there, and it's really just there to illustrate to you the space that is there between Isle Royale and the Canadian mainland. Mm -hmm. uh, the next day that ice blew away from the wind, but later that year it formed and it was a bridge that was there for some time. And um, one of the things we know is also that these ice bridges don't form nearly as often now as they once had. So again, this is another one of these graphs. We saw something like it a bit before. Time is marked on the, across the bottom from the beginning of the study to the present. There's a circle for each year, and the circle is down here on the bottom if there's no ice bridge. And the circle is up at the top if there was an ice bridge that winter. And you can see from the line that's there that ice bridges have been on the decrease in the 1960s. They formed in about three out of every four years. And now, their expectation is about once every 10 years. And so, if wolves had been protecting themselves or saving themselves from inbreeding depressions by a wolf occasionally coming across on an ice bridge, as you can see, this will uh, quickly become not an option for wolves much longer, obviously all because of reasons associated with climate change. And so that brings us to the present day, where we are right now. And so the only thing different on this graph is the color codes have changed, but hopefully that's not distracting. Um, these last few years here, of course, wolves on the decline, moose are on the increase. A little bit more precisely what's going on. This little segment of time right here, when the wolves are declining, this is the first time in 17 years that we detected canine pulpo virus again. And then this decline is interesting too. This decline is associated with uh, nine wolves that died, which for the number of wolves that were on the island is quite a lot. Three of the wolves that died, they died uh, after drowning when they fell into a mine pit. One of those wolves was the alpha male of Chippewa Harbor Pack, and Chippewa Harbor Pack really never recovered from those losses. They never successfully reproduced after that period of time. And so that brings us to today, a, or very recent times, I should say, a year and a half ago, not this winter, but the previous winter, there were three wolves left, and these are the three wolves. The two wolves in front have a very complicated relationship. They are father and daughter. They are also half-siblings because they share the same mother. We're not done. They're also mates. And so the third wolf is their offspring. And that offspring, you can tell, doesn't look very good. By this time of year, the offspring should be about the same size as the parents. They're not. 
And uh, that wolf we now believe is dead. And the last time we counted the wolves this past winter, there were just uh, two wolves left, the two wolves that are in the front there. And this has uh, led to a question that is of uh, some uh, controversy. And it's a question about whether wolf predation on Iowa should be restored. It's so important here, at least it's important to me anyways, to make some finer distinctions. There are, there are still wolves there right now. And it's hard to know how long they'll be there for. A couple years maybe, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less. And um, I, I think most scientists are on the same page that those wolves are probably the last wolves on Iowa. And uh, unless something is done. But that's stuff that's about to happen. What's already happened is because there are only two wolves, two wolves is not enough for wolves to perform their ecological function, which is predation. So that already has been lost. And, uh, and it leads to this question, should that be restored? And this is a, a complicated issue. It has implications for how it is that the National Park Service would confront uh, climate change on the whole. It would be a, a reference point for other decisions. And it also says something about some very basic notions that we hold about how it is that we ought to relate to nature. And, and because it's complicated, I can kind of only give you a, a flavor for some of the things, but here's, here's that flavor. One of you is that we should uh, let nature take its course. That if the wolves go extinct, maybe that's sad, or maybe it's not, but nevertheless, it should just be let to be the case, however it may unfold. And some folks would respond to that by saying, yes, yes, let nature take its course. It's a very fine idea, but we already did let nature take its course. There's disease, there's climate change, there's even the wolves that fell in the mine pit. And, uh, and then the, the counter response to that would be, yes, 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 but but only an addict to intervention would suggest that the remedy would be more intervention. We really should just refrain. And so this is, this is one viewpoint on, on how, to, uh, how to respond to the situation. It touches on um, some very basic relationships between humans and nature that have been expressed really for about 2,000 years. And there are these two ideas expressed on the two sides of the screen. One is that humans and nature are fundamentally separated. That's what allows you to say things like, let nature take its course. Some scholars have pointed out for a long time that that risks being misanthropic because it tends to make people the bad guy, that we can't interact with nature unless it's in some bad way. And then the, the, the kind of the polar extreme of that is that humans and nature are one and the same. And that has some liabilities as well. It can be a little too permissive if the logic can run something like this. Well, if nature is good and natural things are good, and if humans and nature are one and the same, then whatever it is that we do is good. And so, uh, you know, in, in Western, uh, thought. We've struggled with that uh, idea for a long time, roughly for the reasons that I just explained. And um, the other kind of issue that, or uh, the other perspective that can be taken on all, all of this is to suppose that, and this is a big supposition, it's an important supposition, and one that we should uh, consider carefully and think if it's one that we want to adopt or embrace. And it's to say, well, we think that the purpose of a park is to protect ecosystem health. And if we knew that, that is an idea that might guide us as to what to do next. And that will beg a question very, very quickly, which is, well, what is ecosystem health? What does that mean? And this also leads to another really important philosophical question that can be represented by two possible answers to that question, of which there are many answers. One is that, uh, well, ecosystems are healthy to the degree that humans haven't interfered with them. And we've used words like pristine to describe such a place. Again, philosophers have pointed out that risks being a little misanthropic. And the other possibility is that, well, ecosystems are healthy to the degree that they serve our needs. And while it's important that our needs be met, folks have pointed out that that attitude might actually be the cause of many of our environmental problems being so self-centered. And so these are kind of two important benchmarks for answering that question. So much more to say about it, except, but you can sum it up by saying that the answers are not definitive. One thing that can be said, and so far as I know, I haven't met a scientist that's disagreed, is that whatever the definition of ecosystem health may be, it's, it does involve the idea that predation is vital for wherever it is that there are large ungulates like moose. And, and also to recognize that humans are responsible for this loss, at least in part, on Iowa oil, and that those would be reasons to, uh, to intervene and to restore wolf predation. Again, it, it's, it's, uh, there's a lot of facets to it, and my intention was just to kind of give you a flavor of it all. And um, with that, I think I'll stop, and uh, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, no, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty plain, I think, that we would expect moose to keep increasing. They, it's important to know that wolf predation has already been functionally absent for about four years, 
And in that time, they've been growing the, wolf pop the moose population at about 20% per year, which means they doubled in about every four years. I would expect they'll do that again. And I think uh, some of the damage that we saw in Cossack Forest in the mid-1990s, some of the suffering we saw with moose in the mid-1990s, I think we can expect that again, if nothing. Yes. Are uh, coyotes a factor at all? Are they kind of a wolf substitute anywhere? Uh, the question is about whether coyotes are a substitute. Are they, you know, how do they relate in all this? Iowa oil does not have any coyotes on the island. And, um, boy, it's a complicated question. It, it depends on what part of the world we're in. If we're out west, coyotes are a little bit smaller and wolves are a little bit bigger and they're pretty different creatures. Um, in the east, if we go to, just exaggerate it, if we go to the northeast, like in Maine, uh, those coyotes are quite a bit bigger and they behave a lot like wolves. Like from an ecological perspective, they might be, some people argue, not everyone agrees, they might be like interchangeable. Um, yeah. I'll let you call on on the island right now, are they living on small game? Oh, the wolves that are on the island now? This is, you know, I know this very well and I think about it all the time as part of my regular job, but the answer even amazes me. It's really just a statement about the nature of wolves. Those two wolves have been eating moose for the last several years. Those two wolves by themselves have definitely demonstrated that they know how to kill moose. Oh, I thought you said they're not predating anymore. Oh, yeah, yeah, let me, I'm sorry, let me clarify. And so they're definitely predating in the sense of they're killing moose so that they can keep living. But what happens is that two wolves are too few to have a population level effect on the population. Thanks for clarifying that. That's what I meant there, yeah. Back when the, yeah. oh, sorry. Back when the wolf population was up to 50 and it dropped, was there any evidence that there was wolves going on an ice bridge from Iowa to Canada? Did that ever happen? Oh yeah, no, there's been evidence of that. We have, we have just seen directly uh, instances, not very often, mind you, certainly far less than once a year, uh, where there's a wolf kind of halfway between Iowa and the mainland and it's heading towards, uh, towards, the, towards Canada. We also had a situation where a wolf left Iowa Oil a few years ago and within a couple of, well, within a week or two of its leaving, it was shot and killed. And uh, so yes, the, the traffic goes both ways. Um, when wolves leave, one or two wolves leave from Isle Royal. This is kind of uh, incidental in the big picture, but when they come, it can be a big deal because of the genetic infusion that they bring. So if uh, there was a decision to repopulate the wolves, is there a supply to draw from? Where would they come from? And, and would there be any um, uh, resistance to, to having wolves pulled from other areas? Ah, uh, yeah, resistance like uh, resistance by people or resistance um, by the wolves? Or, or other, yeah. other, other areas where the wolves already live, you know, if you're willing to give them up, I suppose. Yeah, sure. Probably. Yeah, sure. So, um, so it becomes, so there's kind of two parts to the question. One part of the question is whether wolves should be brought, and then the other is how would you do that in a technical sense. Um, the National Park Service is, is endeavoring on both questions at the moment. Uh, the question that has received the most attention is all wrapped around this, whether we should do it. Um, my understanding from talking to scientists and my own expertise included lead me to believe that the technical issues are relatively straightforward. They have to be thought about carefully and there's important decisions like what you have, which like what you raised there, but they're not so difficult to figure out. The short answer is going to be if the wolves come from somewhere in the Great Lakes region genetically, that would be just fine. If they had experience killing moose rather than say white-tailed deer, that would probably be quite a bit preferable. Um, so those are some of the considerations there. When you take uh, wolves from the mainland and bring them to Isle Royal, the wolves that are left behind, it depends on who it is that you, that you take um, from the mainland, but they, they tend to be filled by other wolves that are in neighboring territories. Yeah, something like that, yeah. There's a microphone here for you. What would be wrong with allowing these two wolves, obviously, to continue their lifespan here and just waiting further to see what wolves could travel from Canada to the island? Oh, right. Now, you're running the risk of uh, a, a difficult starvation effect on the wolves. Yes. But Mother Nature has some cruel ways at times. Indeed. And I'm not sure that we can jump in every time and come up with the great answer. Yes. No, so, I, yes, no, I, I agree. And did everyone, was everyone able to hear that? 
Yeah, yeah, good. I mean, you're raising important points that haven't been settled, and, and I would definitely say we as a society aren't all in agreement on that. And I, I guess the only thing that I could offer is just to uh, add weight to the ideas that you're proposing, because Iowa is not the only place where we have to make this decision. You, you had mentioned quite rightly that we can't save everything, we can't protect everything. And so what's going to be very important from this point forward is, is kind of asking ourselves, what do we want to save and, and why? And so, yeah, no, that's, that's important yeah. stuff. I appreciate that. Yes? Um, I'm interested in your concept of ecosystem, of ecosystem health. Yes. Which is subject to all kinds of situational yes. ethics and situational ignorance. Yes. But what about the concept of unimpairment, which is a, a mandate of the forest, of the park service? Yes. Uh, maybe you could touch on that a little bit. Gosh, you know, I, I wonder, I see Phyllis is in there. Phyllis, would, uh, do you have a thought on that? I, I think your thoughts is, a, of course, an important term for the park service. Phyllis Green is the superintendent of Iowa National Park, and I, I hope I'm not bothering you, but. Thank you. Um, and here, leaving the parks on a fair is basically leaving the systems intact. Systems intact and functional. And um, this is an island, so island biogeography plays a role in how it functions. Um, and there's a lot of factors we're looking at. So my advice to you is to, if you find this whole topic fascinating, and hopefully John's introduction to it is helping fascinate you, uh, is to stay tuned to it through our planning process, which you can access at um, our world's website. And you'll, uh, we hope to be publishing a draft EIS uh, this fall, and we'll talk about all these different concepts and how they relate to impairment of the system, and talk to you about the trade-offs that might be involved relative to mandates that are part of that part, which include wilderness, which include um, as healthy functioning as you can. But that definition of what's healthy, that's a pretty critical one. So you guys are tying right into the debate. So thank you for doing that. <laughs> Got time for about one more question. There's a sure. question. In the terms of what's natural, uh, I remember being here in the 50s when we had predator hunts and yes. coyotes and wolves were hunted to yeah. extinction. And that certainly dropped the potential for wolves to naturally come from Canada to Iowa oil. Does that consideration of man's interference enter into the equation and thinking about if we stop them from coming, would it be natural to bring them back? Right. You know, it's, it's interesting in the, in the various views that have been expressed and thoughts that have been shared how frequently that idea natural came up. And this idea of what's natural and what's unnatural I know that I'm answering your question from the most obtuse perspective, but I think it's a, probably the most important perspective, is well, that um, this, this, business, this business of, of natural versus unnatural, it's really something that only the Western mind gets hung up on. And as a, as a kind of an alternative to see how the world could be viewed without referencing natural or unnatural, we can think about the Ojibwa people. And the Ojibwa people are, of course, the people that used to live in this part of the continent.